Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. How about one more time? Good morning. And there we are. Good morning and welcome to this service of worship. This lively, rowdy service of worship. Good morning. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> all right, well, I'll see you next week. Um, good morning and welcome to the service of worship at First United Methodist Church of Sanford. My name is David, one of the pastors here. We are delighted to have you here in service with us in person, or if you're joining us online. I've got quite a few announcements to get through, so I want to direct your attention to the bulletin uh, and uh, walk with me through those announcements. First of all, happy Father's Day. Um, yeah, we can clap for that. Um, one of my favorite shirts that I see on the internet says it's not a dad bod, it's a father figure, right? Um, I love that shirt. Uh, and we know, we know that, that father figures come in all shapes and sizes. So whether you have biological children or whether you've mentored kids or served as a coach or a, uh, just a, any, a teacher or anything that's influenced or touched the lives of, of, of young people, we, we honor you today, we, we celebrate you today, and happy Father's Day in that way. We want us, you to join us after the service. We've got donuts and coffee. Join us in McKinley Hall. Uh, come grab a donut and know that you are loved in that way. Um, a couple of quick announcements, not quick announcements, they don't have to be quick. Um, you see that we are blessed by beauty on the altar this morning in three bouquets of flowers for incredible, um, just incredible beauty that we brought into the, uh, the life of the church. You can see on your bulletin why they're there. I want to just especially highlight um, that it is Jim and Phyllis's 66th wedding anniversary this week, which is <laughs> impressive. And June Thomas will celebrate her 92nd birthday with us this week. So. so we give thanks to God for the beauty of these flowers uh, and for the beauty of those events. Um, and uh, you, got a, you, you likely got a letter, an email uh, earlier in the month from Pastor Megan and I about uh, where we stand with our stewardship campaign, where we stand with our finances of the church. In that letter, you, you may have read that there, we are starting to organize teams to get creative about fundraising for larger capital campaigns like uh, a new roof. That is something that is a need that we're going to have uh, very shortly, and we're trying to get creative and think through that about some ways that we can raise some money. So if you have the desire or the passion to lead that team or to be on that team, I just want to remind you to send an email to Pastor Megan, uh, and she will get you connected uh, and get you plugged in in that way. Today is technically the last day of our baby bottle campaign for the Crisis Pregnancy Center. I see that many brought in their the bottles today. If you do not have them this week, please bring them by the office uh, this uh, Monday or Tuesday because uh, the Crisis C Pregnancy Center will come by and pick up all of these things. I've also been asked that if you have extra bottles, um, that, to bring those in as well because they will recycle them and use them next year. So thank you for all who've contributed. We've had uh, a full altar almost every single week, so thank you for your help and for your service in that way. All right, and then two announcements, uh, two, two left, two, just two more to go. Um, you may have seen something on our Facebook this week about a gathering next week, next Sunday. That's June 26th in McKinley Hall, directly following our service. We're going to have an annual conference in review session. You know that every year after annual conference, someone usually stands up from the pulpit and tells us what happened at annual conference and what's going on in and, life, or in and around the life of the denomination. We want to take a little bit more of an expanded view on that this year. Some of you, it's no secret or nuance that the denomination is having a very large conversation about human sexuality and all of the implications that that holds. And so we want to make space for that conversation. We want to let you know as your pastors what happened at the annual conference, where we see we're going, and just all of that, that, that nuance that exists in there. So we want to get, make some space for that next Sunday, June 26th, directly following uh, the service. If you've got any questions and if you... If you have questions but can't make it to that gathering, we'd also love to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, or if you want to submit email questions, that'd be, that'd be fine as well. 
And then my last announcement is simply to note that today is Juneteenth. Uh, as of last year, a nationally recognized holiday that celebrates the end of slavery. Well, technically the announcement of the end of slavery to enslaved persons in Texas, albeit two years after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was signed. And we note that in our church service because, well, for me, for two reasons. One, we believe that we serve a God of liberation that wants us to be free. Amen? And we also recognize the pain and the heartache of justice that is sometimes delayed or deferred. And so I would encourage us to celebrate today, but also to, to take today as an opportunity to vow ourselves to be those that do the justice work of God. As the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, we are called, like the prophet Isaiah calls us, to be repairers of the breach, to see those places in our world that are broken, that are fractured, that are distant, and to be bridge builders. We also take this opportunity to live into our United Methodist baptismal vows to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. So today, friends, as always, might we vow ourselves to be that voice in the wilderness, to be those hands and feet of Christ that work to undo just systems and to work towards shalom, wholeness in the world, in the name and the spirit of God. Friends, let's take a moment to quiet our hearts to find our bodies and our spirits fully in the presence of Jesus Christ as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Will you join me in the reading of the call to worship as printed in your bulletin? As the weak realize their strength, as the poor eat and are satisfied, God's love abides in us. As the stranger finds a friend, as the family offers forgiveness, God's love abides in us. As the ends of the earth, as the ends of the earth know of Christ's grace, God's love abides in us. And all God's people said, Amen. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, send your Holy Spirit on this worship gathering this morning. God, in all that we do and in all that we are, may we make your name known, O Lord. May, may you challenge us, inspire us, move us by the power of your Holy Spirit this day to take one step closer to you, one step closer to our neighbor, and one step closer towards the vision of, of, that you give us in your holy word. Guide us, O Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen. Would you stand for our opening hymn, number 117, O God, our help in ages past. Oh, God, our help in ages past. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. 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 Happy Father's Day, everybody. Uh, This morning we are reading from Psalm, and it's Psalm 38. And this is a prayer that David, King David, has written. We're going to read 1 through 11, and then 21 and 22. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have pierced me, and your hand has come down upon me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and the loathsome because of my sinful folly. I'm bowed down and brought very low. 
All day long, I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish and heart. And my longing lie open before you, O Lord. My sightings is not hidden from you. My heart pounds, my strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. And then down to 20. Oh, Lord, do not forsake me, but not far from me, O oh God. Come quickly to help me, O oh Lord, my Savior. The word of God for the people of God. Well, you're already here. I don't even have to invite you down. If there's other children that want to come down for the children's moment, please do so at this time. But you're already here, already banging your head on the altar rail. Come on down, guys. Well, good morning. Welcome. I have a question for you. You guys can have a seat if you want. Did you guys just hear what we read? You guys, I'll sit too. Did you guys just hear what we read? You did hear? What, what did we read? Psalms. Psalm 38. Wow, you guys are paying attention. Did you hear the words that were said? Well, your eyes really, our ears aren't really working this early? Okay, that's fair. Um, well, it was kind of a sad reading, wasn't it? It was kind of heavy. Why would we read that in church? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Why do you think we might read something like that in church? What do you think? So that God might help us. That's a great answer. I love that answer. Yeah, so do you ever listen to music? Did anybody ever listen to music? What's your favorite kind of music? What's your favorite kind of music? You know, you just like all kinds of music. Do you have a favorite kind of music? You don't really, yeah, that's right. I don't really have a favorite kind of music. I like to listen to lots of different styles. Moses, do you have a favorite type of music? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's a, that feels like a canned answer, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I love it. I love it. You were not paid for your, for your answers. Elijah, Elijah is currently not discriminating. He likes to dance to all sorts of music. So sometimes we like to dance, sometimes we like to sing. Do you ever listen to really sad music? Not really. It's not something that we love to do. Um, but I have friends that, that really like sad music. And I'm going, why do you listen to this music? And you know what they tell me? They say that this music gives me language when I don't have words to speak. So if I'm feeling really sad about something, or I'm feeling really heartbroken about something, or really, uh, really mad or upset about something that's going on in the world, and I don't always have the right words, or I don't know what to say in the right way, those songs and the words of our scriptures today can give us language. First of all, it says it's okay to feel that way. It's okay to be sad in our faith. It's okay to be heartbroken. It's okay to be upset and angry about stuff that you see in the world that you know is not right. And King David and so many others in the book of Psalms wrote those words down to say, yeah, not only is it okay to feel that way, but it's part of our life of faith to say, God, what is going on? God, why can't you help me right now? Exactly what you said. And that's such a beautiful thing. So I want you to think about that. Sometimes when you get big feelings like anger or, or, or frustration, we don't know what to do and we don't know what to say. And I just want to tell us that we have some resources in our, in our book of Psalms and in our, in our Bible that we might be able to turn to uh, and use uh, when we don't know what to say to God. So let me pray for us, okay? Good and loving God, we give you thanks for our entire experience, for the really good times and the really not so good times, for the times that we're heartbroken, for the times that we're, that we're grief-ridden, for the times that we're mad about what's going on in and around us. God, we thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the Psalms. We thank you for the ability to give us language to voice those things to you. And God, we give you thanks that you receive those words as an act of worship, as an act of our faith, and that we don't have to shy away from those words, but that we can take them to you and you receive us with love. It's in, God's, it's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you so much. You guys can go back to your seat.
we now have the opportunity to pray together for one another and for our world. Um, all the people who are listed on our prayer list have asked us to pray for them. All the folks who are here have asked us to lift them up in prayer, um, either in your prayer time this week and together when we're in worship. And so I want us to take that seriously. Take a look at that list. Um, if you know somebody on that last list, give them a call and tell them that we're praying for them and that we love them. Um, and maybe carry this around with you for your personal prayer time so that we can uphold the commitment we have made to our community. I want to invite us now to pray together, and what we'll do is have categories. So we'll share a category, and we'll invite you to share aloud or silently whatever is on your heart, and we'll close each section with, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we showed up this morning, and we offer our prayers because there is something about you that we want to get close to. God, we offer our prayers to you because we know that you are the source of all life and strength, of all hope and healing, and because you have said that you will listen when we cry out to you. And so, God, we come together this morning to hold one another in prayer. We lift up to you all the prayers uh, for those who are seeking healing. For everybody who in mind, body, or spirit is looking for hope. For everybody who needs a way forward. For everybody who's seeking a diagnosis or seeking resolution of illness. God, we lift up these prayers for healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up to you prayers for all who are seeking wisdom and discernment. For every leader whose decisions have a huge impact. For every person who's seeking the next step in their career, in their family, in their life. For everybody who might be sitting at rock bottom, looking for you. God, we pray these prayers for wisdom and discernment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray for everybody who may be lonely. We know that it is as dangerous for our health as many physical conditions, and God, that you did not create us to be alone. And yet, in our world, even in the most connected times, can feel so disconnected. God, we pray for all those who are in our jails and prisons. For everybody who might travel for work or who might be far away from their families. For those in the foster care system. In our nursing care facilities. And for everybody who might find themselves far from the people that they love. We lift up these prayers for loneliness. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. God, we pray for our enemies. We pray for people we don't like and those who don't like us. For everybody who has done us harm or wished us harm and for those that we have harmed. Lord, in our incredibly divided world, we know that you have asked for the healing to begin with us. And so, Lord, give us the courage to pray for our enemies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we celebrate all the places where we have seen you show up, where we have seen the goodness, where we have seen new life, where we have seen hope saved and lives healed. Lord, we do not take for granted all the places where you have worked. And so, God, we celebrate all the goodness that we have seen and all that we have gratitude for. Jim and Phyllis's anniversary for June's birthday. Yes, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we lay all these prayers at your feet and we are trusting that you not only hear but that you act. That you are a God who bends your heart toward the things that break ours. God, we pray that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours. That you would mold us to be a people who are formed by your love and by your justice and by your grace and by your mercy. If there is any way, Lord, that we can shine the light of your goodness in our neighborhood, show us and give us the courage to say yes. Lord God, in all that we do, Mold us to be more like your Son, Jesus Christ. And now let us pray the words that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us continue our service of worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. You 
you can have all this world give me Jesus when I come to die oh when I come to die oh when I come to die just give me Jesus give me Jesus give me Jesus you can have Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, just give me Jesus, you can have all this world, yes you can have. Give me Jesus. Praise God from whom all sings Remind us of the many blessings that you give us. Take this offering and make it a blessing to others. Let it help to continue to build the kingdom of God on this earth. We ask this blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. continue our journey through the Psalms, I'm going to invite you to join me in the Psalter on page 752 as we walk through Psalm 22. Again, every time you see a red R, you will sing a portion of this, and Mitchell will play for that, that for us in just a second once you get there. And if you will join me by saying the bold words, that would be wonderful. Mitchell, will you play sure. our response? shall remember the turn to the Lord. Will you join me in the reading of Psalm 22? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Yet you, the praise of Israel, are enthroned in holiness. And our, our forebearers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He has committed his cause to the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him, for the Lord delights in him. 
Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe upon my mother's breast. Upon you I, ca I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my mouth cleaves to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of the dark. Indeed, dogs surround me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my remnant they cast lots. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who worship the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before the Lord. For the dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. All who sleep in the earth shall bow down to the Lord. All who go down to the dust shall bow before the Lord, and I shall live for God. Posterity shall serve the Lord. Each generation shall tell of the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Surely the Lord has done it. people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to start with a personal question. You do not have to say it out loud, but I do want you to think. Do you know your go-to numbing practice? I know we all have them, probably we probably have a few. And uh, for me, when I have not yet identified the feelings that might be bubbling around in my guts, um, I usually find myself uh, frantically cleaning the house and then in between tasks eating whole handfuls of chocolate chips. Um, I can't have, I, because of my food allergies, I can't have lots of the things that people go to for comfort food. So I go straight to the chocolate, forget the cookie. Um, after I've sent bo boxes and boxes of stuff to Goodwill, and I have sufficiently singed the inside of my nose with like flowery cleaning products, I usually find myself sitting on the floor crying and devising a plan for how I'm going to fix all of it. That's when I'm like, whoops, <laughs> there was something going on and I, I needed to work through it. <clears throat> These are all coping mechanisms, of course. The cleaning, the crying, the pretending like I have control, the eating of the chocolate chips. Some are healthier than others, but at my core, what I need is not to frantically do anything else. If you know me, you know that's how I am. What I need to do is stop, listen, feel the stuff that is bubbling up. Name what is happening. But let's be honest, tears don't taste as good as dark chocolate chips and feeling like I'm still in control. If you have visited a bookstore lately, well, actually, if you've visited a bookstore lately, good for you, because we've got to keep them open. They are closing rapidly. Uh, but if you have visited a bookstore lately and you have checked out the Christian section, you could get the impression that following Jesus, 
is mostly characterized by an easier, nicer life. Unfortunately, that is not the impression when you read the Bible. The Bible is filled with people at the depths of their anguish and at the heights of their suffering. The Bible is full of stories of folks having their very worst days consecutively. So the question for us Christians is, what do we do when it all falls apart? Let us pray. Holy God, we are here and we unclench our fists. We have come to your feet to name what is real and to hear from you. Help us, God, to hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've got two psalms today. Both of them are psalms about somebody's worst days. But if we listen closely, we can hear that they're having their worst days for different reasons. Now, Psalm 38, that was the psalm that Joanne read for us when my child was uh, whacking his head on the altar here. Um, Psalm 38 opens with the psalmist confessing his iniquities have, quote, gone over his head. Now, that's probably difficult to translate Hebrew language, but we know what that feels like, right? When when the iniquities are starting to feel like we're kind of drowning, We get the sense from the opening of Psalm 38 that the natural and logical consequences of this person's choices have sunk him into a place of utter misery. Have you ever been there? I have. You can tell as you read through the words that the writer is at his wit's end and worried that if one more thing happens, God, please, nothing else. I can't take one more thing because it might break him. This is called a penitent psalm. Now, penitent's just a fancy word for, "Uh uh-oh, I messed up. And this this prayer is the sort of thing that lots of us have probably prayed in our own way in different words. God, things are rough out here, and I know I'm a mess, and I know I've made choices I'm not proud of, and I've hurt people I love. I've fallen into the same cycles. I've been the worst version of myself. And God, I want you to hear I'm not asking for help because I earned it. I'm asking for help because you're all I've got, and you're good, and everybody else is far away. It sounds like, help God. This psalm is one that names something universal about the human God experience, right? Ancient Hebrew poetry here, but we know what it feels like in our guts, We need God, even when we have just shouted in the last breath that we don't want God. We need help cleaning up the mess, even when we know we have just made the mess ourselves. This psalm, Psalm 38, invites us to be honest with ourselves and with God and with others. Don't just go for the next handful of whatever will make it better. Name name it. Pour out your heart. Let yourself be real with God. This is our first invitation from the Psalms today. Name it. Pour out your heart. Let yourself be real with God. Now this type of worst day ever however bad it seems, is a little less disorienting than the other types that we're going to talk about. Because at least when the root of our suffering is our own choices, we can make sense of it. When I'm a mess and I make a mess, at least it's a mess I understand. But you all know that's not the only kind of mess or suffering pain that we experience in this world. And that's why we have the other psalms of lament, like today's Psalm 22. 
Psalm 22 invites us even deeper. What do we do when we are having the worst day ever and we don't know why? We didn't cause it, we didn't want it, and where is God now anyway? I want to give us some kind of structure of Psalm 22 to see the picture that is being painted in this poem. It opens with a pain, the, the painful acknowledgement and complaint that, God, you have not answered me. This is verse 2. Things are rough, and God, you have not answered me. Some of us might be a little scared to talk that boldly to God, but I want to remind us, lots of faithful people have prayed this prayer. God, you have not answered me. The next kind of movement of this psalm outlines that the pain of whatever he is suffering through is made bitter and unbearable by the mockery and the abandonment of his community. So the psalmist says, not only are things rough and I feel like, where is God? Where are my people? The psalmist says, I am a worm, not a man. All who see me mock me. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver them. We hear in this psalm the visceral feelings of suffering. We know that that in this sense of abandonment and pain, we not only feel it in our hearts, we feel it in our bodies, right? He talks about how his bones are out of joint. His heart is like wax that has melted. His tongue sticks to his jaw. We hear that this psalmist has the courage to name the pain. And then we hear in verse 21, From the horn of the wild oxen you have answered me. We hear in verse 2, God, the primary pain is that you haven't answered me, and now people are also mocking me. And we hear in verse 21 this turn in this psalm of lament that does not articulate the suffering being over, but it does name the joy, the relief, the hope of God meeting us in the midst of the pain. We see in verse 21 this mirror of verse 2, now God has answered. We hear then that the suffering one goes back to the community. Remember that community that was mistreating him? that was mocking him, that that had abandoned him, goes back to the community anyway and praises God. From the congregation are the words that we read in that psalm we read together. From the congregation I will praise God. And the suffering one in the midst of the suffering shows the congregation, the people, the community, a way to connect with God, a pathway toward remaining in relationship with God, even when things are garbage. And it blesses the community. The end of that psalm somehow turns, did you hear that? I, you probably opened the hymn and you were, the book and you were like, whoa, okay, four sections and we're going to sing in between each one where it's going to be 1120 before we get out. Um, <laughs> I want you to know it's important that we read that whole Psalm 22 because we got to hear the depths of the pain. We've got to hear that turning point. What happens there? And then we've got to see what happens when the psalmist has the courage to walk through that process. We get to the end of the psalm and we hear that the poor will be satisfied, the weak will be comforted, that all people will eat at God's feast, that people dead and alive are going to know Jesus, that that, that they're going to be united with God, that this image that we have, even in the midst of the suffering, is that the suffering is not the end. We are a people who like a happy ending to the story. And indeed, this psalm does end with that upward trajectory of all people praising God and, and God's reign and heart going beyond time and space and all our dividing lines. But I think it's important to note that the psalm does not end with the afflicted simply sharing that everything is fine now and the suffering is over. 
from the midst of the pain is where God met the psalmist. In the darkest moment is where God showed up for the person looking for God. In the darkest day is when the flicker of God's light met the suffering. The thrust of the psalm is that the present suffering is not too far for God to meet you there. And that this God knows something about suffering as well. Something happens in the naming of our pain. Something happens when we trust God enough to say in the same breath, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalm we read today, of course, is the psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross, right? In the last words of Jesus, in in, um, the Gospels, we hear that Jesus quotes this from the cross. In fact, it describes a lot of what happens to Jesus on the cross. He's mocked. He's uh, abandoned by people. They trade his clothes. To name our pain and our sense of being forsaken is not unfaithful. I want you to hear that. If today is not your worst day, I want you to put this in the back of your mind for the next time you have the worst day. Naming your pain to God is not unfaithful. It is not a betrayal of God. We see in Jesus, God incarnate from the cross, giving us permission to speak our suffering. It is an act of faith to be courageous enough to pray when you feel nothing. It's an act of faith to trust God when your anger or your hopelessness or your fear are louder. It is even an act of healing simply to name what is true and what is happening. We cannot get through the trajectory of Psalm 22 without starting by naming what is happening. One of my um, favorite books, although it is gut-wrenching, I do not recommend you pick it up unless you got time and space to process, is a book by Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score. Now, Dr. van der Kolk is a trauma researcher, and he um, was was a psychopharmacologist. I may have said that wrong, but you know. Anyway, he did did medications, and uh, he started doing some research with folks who were experiencing PTSD, Vietnam vets, and other um, populations who had um, high levels of post-traumatic stress disorder. What he found was that people who were having extraordinarily difficult times, kind of flashbacks or, or memories, feeling like the worst day was present forever, when those folks were experiencing those difficulties, there was something happening in their brain. What made their experience last, what made it traumatic and not just a crisis, was that their brain didn't have or couldn't find the language to articulate it. Their brain could not find the language to articulate it, and there was a loneliness in that moment of suffering they could not pull out of. Many of us know what trauma feels like. Uh, Elaine Heath, Dr. Elaine Heath, um, describes trauma as a crisis without an empathetic witness. Lots of us experience crisis, but what becomes traumatic is not having an empathetic witness and the capacity for us to move out of that worst day ever. You see, friends, what Dr. Vander Vander Kolk discovered was that it was not only important to have access to all the things we need for healing, but it was also important to have the words to name what we had suffered through and to have a community to hear it. What we know as Christians is that there is a power in naming the suffering we are in and having a community to hear it. What we know is that God can handle our depths. 
There is nowhere you can go, the psalmist reminds us, where God is not. There is nothing in the human existence that is too far for a God who put on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. God's been to this human neighborhood. God knows we're a mess down here. Whether it is in the depths of our own making or the utter senselessness of suffering as a result of sin and brokenness run amok in the world, God can handle hearing and holding your pain. There is nothing you can say to God that is too much for God to handle. There is nothing you can say that is too much for God to handle. But the Psalms also reminds us that we are not left simply to cry out to God alone and hope for a sign. We are a people in community, right? We are not people who have to simply name our suffering to ourselves and to know that God is with us. We are a people who belong to one another. A people who might sit with our neighbor even when they don't have the words to name it. Even when they're just walking through the most difficult days. We are a people called to one another. In both of these psalms, the suffering of the psalmist is made worse by the abandonment or mockery or disdain of his or her community. We know that that's true, that people having their worst day ever is made worse when there is not an empathetic witness, a people who will stand, who will listen, who will love, who will believe you. We hear in these psalms two examples of community we don't want to be. The gut-wrenching elements of the community described in the psalms, they are the anti-hero. They are the the people we we do not want to emulate. Mocking someone for having faith in their darkest moments. Telling them their suffering is what they deserve. Leaving those to feel abandoned or alone in this world. You see, not only are we people who are called to name what is true, to walk through our suffering, to trust God with it, but when it's not our worst day ever, we are people called to hear and to listen. People called to walk alongside one another. People called to say, I believe you, I'm here with you, and even if you don't have the words, I'll sit. We are invited as both the psalmist and the community to be a people transformed by our own suffering so that we can hold the suffering of others. Did you hear in Psalm 22 that after the psalmist finds God has answered him, that's where it turns. He goes back to the congregation. He is sharing God's grand and glorious vision for the kingdom's fulfillment, the weak and poor, filled and satisfied, everybody knowing and loving God and serving one another. You see, the courage to walk through your darkest day is not only a courage for you, it's a courage for the community you will bless later. Being a follower of Jesus... I believe, is first of all an act of courage. To name what is true and real. To listen to others naming that. And to be walking through our darkest days together. It's not a cool headline. We will not make a lot of publishing books. Uh, A lot of money publishing books on walking through your darkest days and naming pain even when it's still painful. But I believe this is the model that the faithful community has given us since the beginning of our relationship with God. Name it. Pour it out. Trust God with your pain. And then, when you have been met and blessed, hold and trust others. We don't do this often here, but today I want to invite us to a response. 
I want to make space at the altar as we sing our closing hymn. If you are having the worst day ever of your own doing or of the suffering of others, I want to make space for you to, to kneel at the altar and pray. And we will simply be here with you. If you want to be anointed with oil, it's a practice that goes way back in Christian history, anointed for your journey through your difficult days, then we will come and pray for you, we will anoint you, and we will hold your pain alongside you. Because friends, there is nothing, there is nothing that is too deep, too far, or too painful for God. And our job as the church is to hold, hold the pain with you and walk alongside you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 698, God of the Ages. and then to do that for one another. After the service, we'll continue to play, so if you'd like to have some space to pray or have folks pray with you, we will be here. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.